So let's get started. Uh, we are going to venture out into Swing and AWT, Abstract Window Toolkit, today. And uh, what you're looking in front of you is where we're gonna, what I'm going to demo today uh, after I talk a little bit about um, the Swing components and give you the, you know, the boring textbook PowerPoint stuff. After I give you that stuff, then I'll show you some good examples and talk about assignment number four. And before I forget to mention it, because I have already forgotten to mention it many times already, assignment number five is optional. Optional, if you're taking this class here. Um, because uh, it's getting into um, taking an applet and turning it into an application, or maybe it's doing the, the exact opposite. Uh, it's porting an application to a, an applet or something of that nature. You can go ahead and venture out. And you can go ahead and do it. Um, it's actually quite complicated. Uh, it turned out to be a little bit more complicated than I really wanted. Um, for purposes of earning five points, it's way too much work. Uh, if you thought the uh, hash table one, the, <laughs> the data structures one, if you've, if you've done it, if you thought that one was hard, this one's a little bit worse. Um, so in any case, what you can do is, uh, if you want five points extra credit, you can do this assignment, turn it in, and it'll give you uh, a better grade, you know, if you fail something or don't turn something else in. Or you can optionally do this assignment instead of one of the other ones, if you want. But number five is optional, so we only have four assignments for this course, one, two, three, and four. And hopefully I'll have the TA send a message out, hopefully. But the TA is not here today, so uh, unless you know, she's not here today, so <laughs> we will, uh, I'll catch up with her later on that. Uh, so let's talk about swing and assignment number four, which is really the last assignment. Is it the last assignment? Uh, you're shaking your head. So well, let's take a look here. Uh, yes, it is the last assignment because I just made number five optional. And uh, if you're interested, you can actually check out the ping pong applet and you can check out the assignment on the website. For assignment number four, I also have a supplemental video that I put out here, uh, a little how-to video that's going to give away most of the assignment. So if you want to do it on your own uh, and see, test yourself to see if you can actually do it, don't watch the video. And then when you get frustrated and you can't complete it, watch the video. And I'm not going to go through the whole video content today, but I'm going to go through some of it. So there's a little repeat probably in today's examples, today's lecture. And I'm not making the source code available. I just checked it. It's not down here. Um, but if you pause the video, you can watch and you can write the source code down quite easily because I think I basically go through it line by line. So, uh, However, <coughs> there's no excuses. You should be able to turn in all the assignments <laughs> because I pretty much have given you all the code for it. So. All right, without further ado, let's go to the lecture. I can remember where I've got it. Nope, it's not that one. It's this one here. It's lecture number eight. So here we go. And this is good because there's a lot of the foundational stuff I have to sort of describe to you. Um, because if you don't get the basic of what you're doing, it's a little bit difficult to you know, figure out what components I need to add. Because unlike, um, unlike other types of... Um, user interface designing, and Swing is all about user interface components, by the way. Um, it, uh, unlike other programming languages outside of Java, there's really only one way of doing something. You know, like, you know, in Visual C++, there's the, you know, the MFC toolkit, there's uh, you know, Windows resources that you can create for Windows and stuff, and there's one library, essentially, that's part of the package that's part of what you're working with. Same case in other types of development environments. Java, you got options. We have two choices, actually. We have AWT and we have Swing. AWT was the original component that was in there. It stands for Abstract Window Toolkit. It gave you the Java window, gives you Java components, built-in Java. Swing came along afterwards as another package. Pretty much does the same thing, but there are some differences. So I'm going to, as I go through the lecture, I'll point out some of the differences between the two, why you want to use both of them sometimes. In fact, my examples are going to use both together. Um, so the class package I'm looking at first is going to be this one at the top of the screen here because <coughs> I want to talk about uh, Swing first here. Uh, Java X dot Swing, which defines various GUI components. So it's the object for the window, for the menus, for uh, all the GUI components. So what we're looking at is event-driven programming, uh, just like in Visual Basic or Visual C++. Actually, just like uh, HTML code, actually. Um, we have events that occur when the mouse is used, when the keyboard is used, but it's primarily the mouse that we're uh, concerned with in capturing events. But keyboard, mouse, any other input. In fact, there's a newest extension on this that works with, uh, it actually, well, it works with 
a smartphone development and a tablet development where we don't actually have a mouse or a keyboard when we have touch controls and there's an extension, there's libraries actually packages you put in, it makes it easy actually uh, to create the controls for that as well in very similar fashion so you learn it once as a foundation you can apply it to a lot of other types of uh, platforms and utilities the interfaces are a little different, the programming environment is a little different uh, we're not working with an XML interface, we're working with a pure Java interface. Uh, but the concepts extend. What are these concepts I'm talking about? Here's a short list of the concepts. And just like everything in Java, it starts out with a J. A J this, a J that. <laughs> just like all of the exception handling stuff we looked at a couple weeks ago. So we got the J label, the tax field, the checkbox, the combo box, the list, and the panel. These are probably basic, however, most common. There are some other ones out there. Um, you know whenever it goes and memorizes all this stuff, this is what those Java books are good for, or those websites. You know, you go over there and say, well, what component is that? <laughs> you learn the names of the components and you reuse the components. So these are the basic components and what we're doing is building a hierarchy of these components and then we're placing them out onto the screen. Um, so most of the swing components are written completely in Java. Uh, so they provide a greater portability and flexibility than the original GUI components from the package of the AWT. So Swing is written completely in Java. AWT is not. So Swing you can actually extend just like we extended in terms of the abstract class concept. We extended functionality for a linked list for, well maybe we didn't, I don't know. <laughs> I think we did actually cover some of that stuff. The list. Yeah, I remember array lists and lists in this class. Okay. Um, in terms of the container components, uh, in the container uh, list components, um, we can actually kind of do the same thing. We can customize the GUI components. It's written completely in Java. That's why people like Swing. It's more native to the language itself, more native to languages. AWT components are platform dependent, not independent. Uh, some Swing components are still platform dependent, such as JFrame. Here's the issue. Uh, Java is supposed to be cross-platform compatible. So we write one Java program and we run it on all platforms, right? Just like the internet. Uh, however, the window toolkits are totally different <laughs> on different platforms. In a web browser, we don't have to worry about this. The browser program works just fine. In terms of Swing, it is more component. It's, it's more cross-platform compatible than AWT. AWT, which stands for Abstract Window Toolkit, there's a different AWT component for different compilation for each target platform. It's dependent on the platform underneath it. It rides into the operating system. So it'll pull up the MFC libraries from Microsoft, or it'll use Apple compatible or Linux or Unix compatible underlying operating system window calls, which is different. <sighs> Swing actually builds the components, not all of them, as the slide kind of alludes to, the JFrame is still platform dependent. <laughs> the frame is, you know, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but the components themselves are still platform dependent, but there's more flexibility. Some of them aren't. Some of them work universally. So you could, uh, oops, what happened here? You could essentially uh, build an application that could be, depending upon what components you're building, it could be cross-platform 100%. So you have one dot class file that works on a Mac, works on a PC, works on everything. You have to be very selective, however, um, and it's not not that workable. There's a lot of things you have to jump some hoops you have to go through in order to make that happen. Um, but when we're talking about building applications with GUIs, we're talking about building target target class files per platform. It's just the reality of what happens in life. So, so you might come back and say, "Well, I thought Java was truly cross-platform compatible." No, <laughs> the swing. Uh, the, the, excuse me, the GUI components do present some underlying difficulties and it has nothing to do with the, any problem or deficiency in Java. It's just the nature of operating systems. So, <clears throat> Here's the hierarchy. So common subclasses of many of the swing components build in this kind of uh, this kind of a hierarchy where everything comes from Java. Excuse me, everything comes from object. That's a given. All of the other hierarchies come from object. And then we have the AWT component. And the AWT component is created, and then we have the container, and then we have the J component. 
which is going to be our J label, our J text box, and all of the other little things. And notice how we've gone from AWT down to swing. That should be a dot, not a comma, by the way. It's a typo in the slide. I just noticed that, actually. Um, didn't notice that before. Probably because I had my mouse right on it. And I went, oh, what is that, a comma? That's supposed to be a dot. <coughs> but what we're looking at is a pretty generic one, two, three, well, one, about three steps to a hierarchy. So even though you're using swing, you're still using AWT because that's the built-in functionality and then the components are, being, are the ones who are being uh, extended from the swing, which gives us a little bit more variety than the AWT actually originally had. We can still load in a AWT components, however, and I'll show you that towards the end of the lecture. <coughs> so the component class up there at the top, <coughs> excuse me, right below object, um, the operations common for most GUI components are found in the component class. The container class, in fact, component is just a wrapper for everything. It's a GUI component. So it's going to be essentially the wrapper, higher level abstract implementation of the container. And container is going to be something in terms of our, you know, our important methods that um, originate in this class or to add, adds a component to the container in uh, the set layout enables a program to specify a layout manager, helps a container position its components. So you might think of the container <coughs> sort of like the window, but we have a window, we have a frame that we create, and then we put stuff in the frame. So we add items, we add components to containers, we take the containers, we add it to the, excuse me, we add J components or GUI elements, we add it to a container, we take the container, add it to a component. And we can add multiple containers to a component. We can mix and match. It's all leveled out, and I'll show you an example in a few minutes. <clears throat> but it's all leveled out in a hierarchy. Most common thing people forget is to put it all back together. So they create all the different parts, but they don't put the parts together. <laughs> so then you, you know, you load your program up and run. How come the screen's blank? Where's all my buttons and my input fields and stuff? Ah, because you didn't take the J components and add it to the container, but you added the container to the component. So part of your stuff is there, but not the rest of it. So. And once again, you'll actually notice there's all pattern to it all. So when you do it once, it's the same every time you do it. So you get the benefit of learning from the past, actually, in this case. <coughs> so we've got our uh, container. Pass our component in our container. These are just the standard, as I mentioned before, just you'll get into the practice of creating this object, creating that object, and that all looks the same. What differs is the J components. So what I'm going to do is spend a few minutes go through some of the J components, and then we'll put it all together in terms of what, what's going on. So we add these to the container. What are we adding? Our J label as an example. Just as the description would say label, it's a label. <laughs> so the J label object provides text instructions or Information on the GUI, you know, it's an enter your name here. It's a read-only piece of text that shows up on the screen. Displays a single line of read-only text. You can't edit a J label. <coughs> um, an image, or both text or an image can also be put. You can actually add an image to the J label. So you can have a, you know, click here and put like a little help icon or something there. You know, click here for help or something. And just like a label that you would see in, let's say, Visual Basic or Visual C++ in terms of working with the GUI tools. Here's an example, one thing to emphasize in terms of the example code. I'm going to show you the example code in a few. So when you see this example code, I'm not going to show you the code until I'm all done. That way I don't have to switch back and forth between the two. Uh, one thing to emphasize, however, is you, don't <coughs> you do not explicitly add a GUI component to the container. So the GUI component will not be displayed when the container appears on the screen. Um, so we're going to add it in sort of an interesting kind of way. Um, and I'll show you that in the examples in a few minutes. So. so to make the interactive GUI component part of the program, to make the interactive GUI component, you're going to need a component. The components are going to be, as an example, the J label, the buttons, the windows, the menus. And then you're going to have events. So this is really traditional style event-driven programming. And the event's going to be a mouse click, a right click, a left click, a window close, window open. Somebody entered into a field, exit out of a field, hovered over a button, moved away from a button. All those sorts of different events. We have an event listener interface and an event handler, which are going to be methods that are going to be associated with the events. So it listens for the event to be triggered 
and then performs the actions to handle them. Exactly like your C++ interface, exactly like everything else. It's pretty standard, actually, kind of interface. So here's our uh, event handling model, a little example of some actions that might occur. So some of the GUIs are event-driven. They generate events when the user interacts with the GUI. Some of them aren't. Uh, not all of the components will generate event-driven type of actions. Moving the mouse, clicking a button, typing in a text field, selecting an item from a menu uh, is event-driven. Uh, when uh, e interactions occur and an event is sent to the program, many different event types might be uh, defined, and here's our library. Here. So if we're going to use the events, we don't have to. We can just put stuff on the screen. But if we want to capture events, we normally have to include the package or import the package java.awt.event and java.swing.event. There's an AWT component. It picks up on the AWT side. If it's a swing component, J component, it picks up on the swing side. So it's kind of interesting we have both. Imagine you have two packages in one that you're working with, essentially, for everything. So some, why they didn't merge them all together? It gives you more flexibility to have them separated out, actually, because then you can do different things with it. You don't have to follow one particular standard. But then when you go on the Internet, you start looking at examples. Some of them are using Swing. Some of them aren't. <laughs> some of the earlier versions of Java didn't, didn't actually support Swing either. So This is where you want to get the most current uh, release of the JDK. <clears throat> to get the most current, because they've actually changed it a lot recently as well. So you want the updated version if you're going to work with the swing components. Um, so here's some events that occur, an action event, an adjustment event, component event, input event. So the list on the bottom you've been looking at is just kind of a small list of uh, sample events. There's a lot more, actually, but it uh, gives you an idea what they look like. There's an interesting picture of the hierarchy, and uh, the slide's kind of fuzzy. It's hard to see it. But we've got three parts to the event handling mechanism, and this is generic. This, this applies towards a lot of different programming languages. You know, we got this source. You know, was it a button? Was it a label? The GUI component that uh, the user is interacting with, that is the event location where it occurred, the source. And we've got the event object, which is encapsulated information about the current event. They clicked a button. They entered or clicked into a text label so that the person changed the text or something. And then we have the listener, which is the third component. The listener is the object that notifies the event source when the event has actually occurred and provides a response to the event. So it's kind of like the try and the catch. The listener is actually the try. You know, it looks, if you're not familiar with that terminology, it's like error handling, um, event-driven error handling, where you're listening, waiting for something to occur. <laughs> There's usually an event a queue that occurs as well. So the uh, Java JVM actually handles the events, and the JVM will queue up all of the different button clicks so it doesn't lose something. Because if you imagine the event-driven behavior, sort of like interrupt-driven behavior, something happens, and then something else happens, and something else happens, and then all of a sudden you have way too many events, you're going to lose track of each one. Because you can't really process them sequentially. You sort of have to capture them, save them temporarily, and then go through the list and start dealing with them. And then... What ends up happening in Java, if there's a if there's a method that's supposed to be run, if you actually in, implemented the handler, then the method runs. If not, nothing happens. <laughs> so you don't implement the event handler, the method, whatever is supposed to happen when the event occurs. And the user just clicks there, clicks there, click, click there a thousand times, a million times, all day. Nothing's going to happen until the programmer actually puts the code in. So the programmer must perform two tasks process the GUI event. Here's the two tasks you have to perform. Register an event listener. So you tell the event listener to listen to this button. <laughs> listen to this text field. If you don't do that, you're your host, because it's not going to listen to it. And then well, once it's listening to it, then you implement the event handling method. As I mentioned before, the event handling method is going to be, well, when the user clicked on the button, then put up this little message screen that says, sorry, you know, you didn't fill out your form correctly or, you know, run, a, run an error checking. So the event listener, the object of the class that implements one or more of the event listener interfaces is from the event and the swing event. They can both come from the same place. What we have over here <coughs> is the object from language. And this is event listener up here. You can't read it, but it says event listener. And from event listener, 
I'm not going to go through them all, but there's a half a dozen or more different types of events that can occur. And I'll just go kind of go through the first three. I had them listed in the previous slide, actually. There, this list right here. These are the events that are written that you can't see over here. This is action listener, adjustment listener, and a component listener, <laughs> a container focus item listener. Do we switch an item in a multiple select item kind of component? A key listener, did the user type something? What did they type? Listen for those keys. So from the event listener component, what we're looking at is all the different subcategories of all the different events that can occur. We can write a method. We, we can listen for certain events when the event occurs. We can, the ones we're listening for are going to be caught. The other ones we're not listening for are going to be ignored. So you don't have to worry about how many events there are out here. You don't have to program an event listener for every single one of the events because some of the events are never going to occur. And then if they do occur, I don't really care if the user clicked the right mouse button or the left mouse button, or if the user double clicked or single clicked, or if the user, whatever the activity happened to have been, you just want to know, did the user touch it? <laughs> so, and what's interesting actually, if you think about it, is the touch control interface much easier. And it's like, was it touched or was it not touched? <laughs> and where was it touched? The hardest thing with touch control interfaces to program, if you haven't ventured down into this yet, is what coordinate and how close you want to make the proximity of the coordinates around the object. Because if you haven't noticed, some, some applications are kind of, you know, tricky in terms of, you know, if, if, if you, especially if you've done it on a PC before, because there's a lot of uh, computers now with touch screens on them. In fact, Windows makes a library to give you the touch screen interface. It's like sometimes I press them like in the middle of the object, but nothing's happening. <laughs> which is irritating. And then sometimes you press like right in between objects and you get one object instead of the other object. So most of it is kind of like mouse, it's like mouse event programming in a lot of ways um, because of where you click the mouse. But and a good thing about Java, however, in this particular interface with the mouse and the clicking in the objects, it's identifying it by object. And it's the listener of the object. You don't have to mess with coordinates at all. You never have to deal with that, which is Interesting. So it's it's, and it's just as a side comment, the touchscreen interface just presents a whole slew of different ideas in terms of having how to make the user interface more effective. Students are getting younger. <laughs> I hear kids screaming in the hall. <laughs> a lot younger. All right. So J text field and J password field. There's a single, okay, so well, you know what you know, password field is in Visual Basic, Visual C++, MFC interfaces, you know, I put stars, you know, so when you type a word, it's like a property normally sent, except for we don't have, well, we have properties. We can set properties the same way, but we do them programmatically. One of the biggest difference, and let me, before I forget to mention it, let me mention something that's kind of interesting. There's a ton of GUI development you know, window of development tools in Java where you drag and drop. If you're familiar with Microsoft Visual Studio and the whole canvas and you take these widgets and you put it on the canvas and you right mouse click and you fill out the properties of each one of the components and it's all GUI based. One of the biggest complaints that beginning Java people have is, where's the GUI? <laughs> How come I'm using Notepad to type all this stuff? You know, so uh, Eclipse doesn't, I don't, I have not seen one for Eclipse, but it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. But there are some GUI programs, but it's just like those HTML generating programs, because people don't like to write HTML code either. Instead, they'll get one of these, what you see is what you get kind of things, and it converts it to HTML code. You're going to get 10 times as much code if you use one of those Java GUI developers. Then if you just write the code yourself, the code itself is like maybe 20 lines, maybe, for a complete kind of GUI interface. It's going to be like thousands of lines for one of those, inter and it's going to run slower. Because you're going to have way too much stuff in there you don't need. So you can create a more streamlined, streamlined GUI if you just write the code yourself. And we'll see in a few minutes, you can accomplish a lot with very few lines of code. So one of the biggest components is getting the information in. You get the information in through the text fields. The text fields are have password field object. And the interesting thing, the point I was making originally was there's different components. Instead of setting properties, we have a separate password field. We have a separate JTEX field, so, which is kind of interesting. Everything else would have a property on text field to make it password. <laughs> or 
to set it to be a password instead of a regular text field. But we have two separate components. So the breakout of the components is a bit, you know, tedious in my opinion. But So we have a single line of, uh, <coughs> going back to what these are, there's a single line area to which the text can be entered in. It's not a multiple line, it's a single line. We have a multiple line text, uh, but that is a different field, excuse me, a different component. The user uh, types the data in and presses the enter key. The enter key triggers the event. So the enter key and the action event occurs. So if there's no enter key, <laughs> no action event, uh, but usually there is an enter key. And you can actually pick it so, you know, the focus leaves from one to the other. The mouse clicks, you can take and, you know, you know, because users aren't necessarily going to press enter, they're going to essentially just, you know, click in fields and type stuff. Uh, so you can change the behavior if you wanted to, but we, if we do press enter key, we get an action event that occurs. So if the program registers an action listener, the listener processes uh, the event, can use a data in the text field anytime during the event. In the, any, excuse me, text field at the time that the event in the program occurs, takes the text field, whatever's current in the text field, and uses that in terms of its processing. Again, example code, let's just wait for a few, and I'll show you it all at the end. So, Buttons, you can't have a program without buttons. Input buttons, select buttons, uh, process buttons, the button component. Uh, and the user clicks to trigger a specific action. So there are several different types of buttons. There's a subclass of abstract button. You can actually make your own button. Uh, not too many choices, though. Most of the but standard buttons work for everybody. But if you want to do something fancy with a button, I don't know. You can make it a circle button instead of a square button or something. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, command buttons is uh, created with the J button. generates an action event when the button is clicked. You can toggle buttons, have them on and off, true or false values. You can have check boxes that are buttons or groups of buttons. Uh, each generates an item. Uh, item event, which item of the text box group was selected. Kind of just like HTML, kind of just like Visual C++, Visual Basic. Radio buttons as well, group of buttons in which uh, you can be selected together. So you can multiple select. You can actually create the check boxes to multiple select as well. All done in your program. So we have the J component. <coughs> the abstract button that's part of swing and then from abstract button we have the toggle button the J button and then we have J check the check boxes and radio buttons uh, so we'll we'll see some interesting components with that menus this is probably the easiest thing to put together <laughs> is the menu the drop down menu or the combo box as well uh, I was gonna say we're gonna Kit menus in a second, and I'm looking at combo boxes right now. Uh, the J combo box. Um, it's a drop down box, looks like this picture here, where we've got a list of items for which the user can select from. It generates an item event because what we want is was an item selected? And then the item event will pass the information in terms of instead of what's written in a text box, but what item was selected. The J list, here's a list box. So this is a single select. We can do a multiple select if we want. Um, and then here's a this basically, you know, click something here, copy it over to here kind of concept in terms of items being selected. So it would be a J list, a list box. We can have the scroll bar. We cannot have the scroll bar. It's up to us. So a list that supports a single selection versus a multiple selection generates a list selection event uh, in terms of the event driven handout uh, layout. Excuse me format. Uh, and then last but not least, we're not really last, but close to last, the layout manager. So we have all these components and we stick them in a layout. And then we stick the layout onto the container, into the container, and we load it all up and we show it to the user. So all of it's in a hierarchy, as I mentioned before. So we have um, interesting kind of flows. So the flow layout takes and word wraps all your components. When you make the screen this way, we go this way. When you make the screen smaller, it goes this way. Hardly very much control. And uh, this is, uh, you know, again, sort of like other different types of programming languages where you create sections of the screen, you add items to the different sections of the screen. So you can have a layout on the top of the screen, a layout on the bottom of the screen, and the middle of the screen. Reminds me of HTML programming actually with uh, tables, or with frames, uh, but it's integrated together. We don't have the same kind of kinds of problems that we do with the, let's say, frames in HTML. 
because it's not separate, it's all together. Um, all components in the container are positioned by the layout manager, so we're going to make an instance of a layout manager, at least one. Uh, buttons of the above example are, are managed by the flow layout, so which uh, is the default layout manager for the panel. So the default lines go horizontal until there's no more room, and then they word wrap. So I was talking about in terms of word wrapping. Hard to control your components. Hard to create a standard looking interface that's going to look the same. You resize the window. Flow layout is going to rearrange your items. Not such a good look sometimes. After resizing, it's going to reflow the components automatically. The default is to center the components in each one of the rows. So you can choose by uh, aligning them to the left or to the right of the container. So here's some example code from panel.setLayout. This is the panel. Set layout to a new flow layout and make it left justified instead of center or instead of right. Other layout managers you can go and I'm not going to click on the link because I don't want to ruin my... Uh, every time I click on links I don't seem to have internet access for some reason. <laughs> it ends up hosing my computer. So uh, That actually still works. I just tried it out a couple weekends ago. and uh, That URL still works. Even though it says java.sun, it actually goes to an Oracle website. Here's some more examples actually using the panel. Potential problems with the border layout. The button is stretched. Here's a button on the bottom of the border. So we've got the border layout. The button is stretched border to border. <laughs> That's a huge button. <clears throat> so the button is stretched fills region of the frame. And so the entire southern region of the frame is filled with the button. Uh, so if you add another button to the same region, uh, it's going to be displaced by the first button and they're going to be back to back. So you have maybe button one and then button two. So they're going to Essentially, the border layout fills in the frame, excuse me, the panel frame border to border. Uh, a solution to this is to use another panel. So we add panels. Instead of using just one panel, we add multiple panels. And then we can add multiple components to the panels. And then set the different layouts for each one of the panels. And then we essentially have the ability to give us maybe this look instead, which is a little bit more appropriate for a user interface. Uh, if we think. It's all up to user interface design, I suppose. So it acts as a container for the interface. The, the panel itself, using additional, will act like, its, act like its own interface elements and can themselves be arranged inside of the larger panel. So we can use a flow layout by default uh, to fix the problem of the border layout, create a panel, add components to the panel, and then add the panel to the larger container. Here's the example code for it. J panel P is equal to new panel, new J panel, P dot add button, P dot add button two, add button three, and then the frame dot add to panel from using a border layout south, which is down on the bottom. So this is our first sort of real code example. I'm going to show you a lot more in a few uh, as soon as I get done with this PowerPoint. But uh, you can kind of see how the hierarchy is built. You know, we create a panel, and what we're doing with the panel is just adding stuff. So the components get added, they get removed, they get set to visible, they get set to invisible. Yes? This complete screen, that is a frame, right? Yes. So the frame a J frame. In the panel. Yeah, the, half this, this code is missing a few. I'm going to show you the whole thing in a few minutes. But this is just a snippet of creating this panel layout, and the excuse me, the border layout that's applied to the panel. And the border layout is setting it down in its orientation to south instead of to left or to right or some of the other options. And it's just showing you that the panel itself is having components added to it. And the components are going to be button one, button two, button three. We actually didn't create the buttons in this code. <laughs> we would have to, if this goes incomplete, because we'd have to create the J frame. We would have to actually Create the you know create the container the outer components which are missing create the lower components that are missing, and then this would be towards the end actually we create the panel put those components in the panel and then we add them essentially to where we want it to be located because we can take a hierarchy of this entire frame here and subdivide it out into like uh, different different layers of abstraction and then work with each one of the different layers independently of the other layers which is kind of interesting. Then we can move stuff around to different layers without having to re, you know, create a new button. You can use the same button and just move it to the different components. This is why the GUI tools, people favor them sometimes. Because <laughs> you don't have to know any of the stuff. You just 
drag stuff, oh, let's fix that, you know, and you're visually, the GUI tools that allow you to visually kind of modify the components. Uh, so, anyway. Here's some supplemental reader uh, reading material if you're interested. Just some links creating GUIs with the JFC, the Java Foundation classes instead of MFC, Microsoft Foundation classes, um, and the Swing components. Um, I believe this tutorial actually runs you through um, a lot of a couple of different examples that uh, are effective. So, so let's uh, let's see how this actually looks. See what this actually works looks like. So. Let's go back and revisit the assignment so we kind of know what we're building. And uh, this is assignment number four. And there's a couple of things to it. I think the next lecture actually gets into a... I'm not going to do the next lecture today, but I believe lecture nine, let me just check my memory real quick, is going to talk about the menus and the file I.O. Uh, network programming? No? Let's see. Hold on one second. Just do a memory, memory load again here. In a future, no? Did I already talk about file IO? Did I cover file IO? No? Next time, we'll do the PowerPoint on the file IO. I'm going to show you what the file IO looks like, though. It's not as bad as you think it is. It's actually quite easy. In fact, it was probably lecture seven, and I don't know how I. I'd have to go through my notes, actually. I'll do that for next time. I don't want to waste a, today doing it. Uh, I'm going to assume that I have not gone over this assignment yet, <sighs> correct? Okay, good. <laughs> so, that's what happens when we take a week off. The brain goes on vacation. I have no idea what's going on in this class anymore. <laughs> in this lab, we are going to program with Swing and File I.O. Uh, I may have covered File I.O. I think I did. Yes, I did. Okay, very good, because I'm like, how did I not cover that? It was a while back. It was two weeks ago. All right. Yes, I covered file I.O. and exception handling. An event, yes. Oh, check out the last lecture if you want the file, file I.O. information. Um, great, I'm not going crazy. That's good for a minute there. I thought I was going crazy. All right. So we cover, well, I'll review the file I.O. again. So your application is going to look like this. This is what we're building. And uh, I'm going to build the file menu for you. I'm not building the style menu. Because you have to do something. And you might think, well, that's a lot. You're doing a lot for us. Not really. It's not that many things. Uh, this GUI here is going to have several different components to it. We're going to have a JTEX area component. This is the JTEX area component. Uh, it's a text area, not a text box. It's not a one single line. It's an area. What's it? This is Notepad. My little text editor. In fact, in my example, says calls it Java Pad, but it's Notepad. You just type stuff into it, and it works. And the Java Pad actually comes out of a book. It's not. Uh, it's it's a textbook example essentially. It might come out of a Deedle and Deedle text. I can't remember. I think I may have actually put it in the. Hopefully, I cited the reference in the in the code. We are going to look at a J menu bar component, which has two J menu components to it: a file and a style menu. Uh, component. So a J menu component here for the file is going to have a, three items in it, a file open, a save as, and an exit. And uh, what we've got here is a J menu component as well for style. This is the part you have to do on your own. Uh, which is, not I always call it tricky, but you're going to create a submenu that I'm not going to show you. So the style is going to have a submenu, two submenus actually, the one for fonts and the one for text area and this is actually pretty easy once you and what what this will do is test to see do you know how to get at the properties of the components because you're going to change the background text you're going to change it for you can change the font type to something and you'll see the font being set actually um, quite easily and there's not very much code for this um, plain bold italic perhaps or some of the menu options also foreground color background color you know, items containing pink, white, blue, black. I mean, it could be creative. You can put anything you want in. Here's an example of the foreground color, pink, the background color, white. This is essentially what you're going to be building to the application I'm already going to give you. Doesn't It's not that hard. <laughs> so you're also required to achieve the following task with uh, three components. And this is going to demo the file I.O. component, the file chooser. 
so if you do a file open and you're gonna see by the example I'm gonna show you in a few minutes you're gonna be able to open up a file in fact this one is generated automatically for you uh, so you can open up a file and either double clicking the file name you know, by double clicking in the window or by selecting it pressing in open uh, which is all part of the GUI nothing you have to program uh, so the component uh, to the file is going to select it's going to be put into the text area imagine notepad you find a text file you open it up puts it in the text area for you so, uh, you don't have to do any error checking you don't have to do any you know like is this a text file is this not a text file kind of thing so here's a hint down here begin with the open command you've already uh, we've already done it with file choose actually I think this is now referred to as chooser um, but that, that might also be uh, not really a typo it used to be called file choose I believe they've recently in the current API and I'll take a look at that in a few minutes I think it's called chooser now um, if you go to this this site right here which does work you can check out all of the different components that are for that and uh, also a message box, you know, for J option pane. We'll see that a little message box comes up and says, "Sorry, your file's not found" or something. Or you know. if you don't put the little text message box in here, don't worry about it. It's not a really huge part of the program. What I'm looking for is the menu items with the, the style in it, because you're going to get everything else actually. So when you click on File Save, you should be able to pick a location for the file, and the file is going to save to that location, and then you can open up that file again. So here's a, another hint here. Uh, same as in task one, in terms of this file save, the functionality is pretty much the same. You're clicking on file exit to exit the program, file save to save the program. Um, you should be able to change the font style, the background color, the foreground color, and the text area. Uh, so, And uh, that's the base of the assignment. Let me show you what it looks like. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to take this one step further. And point out that there's a different video on this right here that you know as I mentioned before struggle through the assignment see if you can get it if you can't get it watch the video next <laughs> this is going to give you everything so everything that I'm going to go over right now actually but in a little different perspective probably a little slower but I've taken my uh, sample code and I've put it into a project labeled it assignment number four and the code here's all the code here in fact, let me make it a little bigger so you can kind of see what I'm looking at. I'm not, I'm not going over it yet. What I want to do is kind of show you this is the amount of code we're writing, and we're using AWT events as we looked at in the lecture, Swing and the Java IO, which I went over last time. So that's all the components we're looking at. And this is the code. Yeah, I don't know how many lines that is, but it's not that bad. It's all in one program, all in one Java file. Not so bad. And if we take a look, and what I want to do is kind of demo the functionality first so you can kind of see what it is we're, we're running, what we're building. And then you're going to be in awe, like, you know, oh, that is really easy. <laughs> That's the purpose of this, is make it, make it easy. So let me, I just basically selected to start my text editor. This is the window that was built from the code that you just looked at. If I type something in here, Actually, let me make it bigger for you. This is the window that is built. This is what came up when I selected to run it. This is a, a text file example. And then I'm going to I just type this in. This is a text area that we've created. This is a menu bar up here that we've, uh, we're going to implement. If I click on File and I go Save, this is generic. This is going to look different on your OS. It's a swing component for file chooser that looks like a Windows one on a Windows machine. It looks like a, because it's actually calling it from the underlying operating system. The code is actually not, it's a swing component, it's not actually part of Java, which is interesting because now you can, if I took this code and you, you take it and you run it, you take the class file, run it on it, and you're going to get a different file chooser looking. You're going to get the Windows, you know that little window that comes up? file, everyone's seen it. It's the same window that comes up every time you run a Windows program and you have to pick a file. Same identical. This is what it looks like actually on a MacBook. Same identical window I see all the time that comes up. I'm going to save the file. I'm going to put it on the desktop. Uh, let's see if I can put it on the desktop. Why on my desktop? 
No, it's going to be in Behacker Desktop. Wait, hold on a second. Oops, my mouse is a. Uh... Okay. My GUI isn't the best. All right, let's just put it in. Uh... Hold on, I got to go back to where I was. <laughs> desktop. There we go. <laughs> I'm going to call this test. No, I'm just going to call it test. I'll, I'll put a dot t t. I'll be a Windows person. I'll put txt on the end of it. I'll do it for you for Windows. Now the file is right here. If I open up this file, it's going to open it up in text text edit, which is my default. You know, my text edit which is my default text program. But you see, you see the functionality actually works. Hopefully, if I uh, open it here, I should see the file. I do. I can open it up. Here it is. I mean, I like say, you know, actually you can't tell that it works unless I go like this. So we see we have a functioning notepad program. So let's build it. So I'm going to exit. I'm going to close down this here. And you'll see, and um, what this is, we'll do is kind of focus, and what I'm going to do is kind of go through and focus on what I just covered in the PowerPoint, but put it in perspective of real implementation. And put the pieces together for you so you can see how the hierarchy works. It's as big as I can possibly make it. Let's see. <laughs> That's pretty big. Is it big enough? I can go bigger. No? Let's see. I can go a little bigger. There we go. <laughs> All right. Here's our basic includes, or excuse me, imports. I'm in Java, not C++ right now. <laughs> so <laughs> I was just teaching a C++ class yesterday, and this, this is the problem. All right. So let's see. We've got AWT. We've got AWT event. We got Swing. We got IO. Basic standard. This is just going to suppress a warning. I've got ignore this. It's an Eclipse issue, and just like uh, you know the types things. I'm not doing any error checking on the file. I'm not doing anything, so it's it's going to essentially give me a give me it's going to it's going to give me a warning, and I just suppress the warning. So let me get the screen focused correctly. There we go. All right. So what do we have? We have a class, public class, JavaPad, extends JFrame. Not extending applet, not extending anything. You, know, you don't have to put an extend on there. What is JFrame? JFrame is sort of like applet, and the reason why I said applet is because we can extend from higher level objects that give us our application type. So the next programming assignment, the one I said it was optional, you would say, you know, you would extend from applet, which means you're going to create an applet. Here we're going to create a JFrame. So we're extending from, and what's the JFrame? Well, that's the frame. That's the, what we talked about earlier. That's the window that shows up. That's the, you know, the, the program that we're so familiar with when we use Windows. It's the, the base window. So here's our components that we're going to create. And the components, we've got two components. We've got the text area. And this is the J text area. This is the reference to the object, if you remember, uh, when we create. And we're keeping the data members. These are data members, actually. We're keeping them private. And we have public methods that we're going to use to, you know, regular old Java. This is done traditional Java format. So our private components here, which is going to be our data members, we've got edit area is what we're going to call it. It's going to be a J text area. It's a reference to an object that we're going to create down here. And the object, whoops, is going to be down further. I'm sorry. It's going to be down further. That's going to give us uh, the ability to create a text area and to set the properties for the text area that we're going to create. And yes, I was right. It is called File Chooser now, not File Choose. <laughs> so they renamed it. Um, what is this that keeps coming up? Uh, so it looks like some help menu comes up. Oh, this is actually kind of interesting. The little pop up help menu that came up for Java File Chooser is going to give you the syntax for how to create the chooser, which is nice. Okay, so I've got the uh, file chooser. File chooser is getting a new file chooser, creating a new object for the file chooser, creating a new text area uh, to put the stuff in. And then we're going to create, so what, what, it's common to see the components created up front and then everything created in groups, like all components created together, you know, all action items created, all events defined together, because then it's easy to find stuff. You don't have to do it this way. You don't have to create it until you actually need it or use it. So you, this is sort of reverse for like what a lot of other people like to try to do. They'll create all the outer stuff. They'll create the higher components first, and then they create the lower components. I like to create the lower components first, and then create the higher components and put them in the higher components. 
This might be reverse psychology, I don't know. But this, this example is following it the way that I like it. Um, so create, and it doesn't matter, as long as you create them all, you know, before you put it all together, it doesn't matter what order you create stuff in. So after I created my two components that I'm going to be using, because the application is only really using two components, it's using that text area box, it's using the file chooser. Now I'm going to create the actions. Here are the actions, and this is the action, the action of open action, the, open, the action of save, the exit action, which are going to be new actions, part of the event drive, and we'll see the actions actually being used further down. But creating the actions for the menu items, for the buttons, they're extending from the AWT, so they're part of the interface. We just say action, open action, action, save action, exit action. We can, don't have to create all of them if we're not going to use them. We only create instances of the objects that we're going to use, and these are instances of the options that we're going to have in the menu. Believe it or not, this is our main method. <laughs> our main method makes a new JPAD. New JPAD. We don't even, we're not even, we're, I'm not even going, you know, JPAD, my JPAD is equal to new JPAD. I'm not even going to give it a reference because I'm never going to use it. So the JPAD is going to be a and, and you'll see, you'll find that most GUI developed applications, you're going to have a main that has one line in it, just like this, because you don't need a big main. Unless you're going to open a file, do something with it, load this all this stuff, and then load the GUI. So your primary concern is loading the GUI. So, so let's cycle JPAD. Here's our JPAD class. So we have some constructors in here. Uh, in fact, we're in the JPAD class, nested main in there. Uh, but we are still in the public J class, JPAD that extends JFrame. So here's our constructor number one, our basic constructor. And our JPEG constructor is taking and it's going to create a scrollable text area for us. So here's that edit area. Going back to the comment I made, I put it up here. I didn't have to. I could take this, cut it, paste it, put it right here. Only problem is later on in the code, this, this is bigger. I'm going to, what was that called? <laughs> I know it's called edit. I know I can look up here and what are these components that I'm using? And I can find all my components right here. It's kind of like how in the old days, you know, when you learned C, they said, to find all your variables at the beginning of the program, and then put comments in them. You know, integer i is going to be used for counting, and integer j is going to use for this, and kind of the same concept. It's like you can find it easier, easier, because when we go down a little further in the code, you go, wait a minute, where is that? What is that called? It's going to be hard. Uh, so here's all, all of the properties. I've actually created the reference for it edit area up there, edit area is a JTEX area, so I'm going to say edit area, now I'm going to create the object. So the JTEX area is a new text area that's 15 by 80, happens to be the same size as my, my JFrame, because uh, it's going to fill in the JFrame. You can actually make it half the size. You know? I don't know what you'd put down below, maybe some buttons or something. So the text area only goes down, you know, leaves a little column at the bottom for status or something. You can put two, check, two text areas in there if you wanted to. So I'm going to set the border, <coughs> the border factory to a create an empty border, which means there's no line. So actually there is a line, there's a 2 by 2 by 2 The border is set, and this is going to be the upper, this is going to be all sides of the box, top, down, left, and right. And what you do is you kind of experiment with it a little bit to see how thick you want the border. Um, if I, you know, change this to, you know, 8, 8. Eight. We'll see if we notice a difference when I bring it back up. Let's see what happens. Uh, we can set the font. Hint, hint. You're setting the font in your style menu on the text area. So it's a text file. The fonts aren't going to save with the file if it's a text file. But when you show it in the screen, it's going to change the text font to. Now yeah, let's change it to 20. <laughs> We're gonna have an interesting looking. Uh, we're gonna have an interesting window when we're all done with this. <laughs> so maybe not. But when you're changing, it, and uh, this is the reason why I said hand hands is because this is the line of code that you're going to use after you select which font you're going to change it to on the menu item, and you're gonna fix the font so you don't have to worry about it. It's gonna be bold and italics. Maybe I don't know if I have you set the style. I think I do have you set the style. Um, you could put stuff in there for Times Roman for basic font libraries. Uh, make sure that they're ones that are going to be supported on the operating system that you're using. So, 
and you can go online and look up which ones they are. But this is what you're going to run from that menu item that you're going to create for the fonts. All right, J scroll pane. We're going to create a scrollable pane, which means we're going to create the pane with a horizontal, uh, excuse me, a vertical uh, up and down arrow. So if the text area, because the text area is 80 and the window size is maybe not going to be that big, so we'd have to scroll through it to see all the window. We didn't see the scroll bar, I don't believe, in the beginning because the text area wasn't wasn't being populated. We didn't have to scroll anything. So the J scroll pane is going to be a scrolling text and be equal to a, a new J scroll pane. This is the pane that's going inside of the frame. Wow, I said that right. That's good. <laughs> the pane in the frame. Uh, we can have more than one pane, as we saw. We can create another pane if we want, but we're not. We're just going to use the entire frame body for this one pane, and the one pane is going to hold the edit, the edit area. So you can kind of see a little nesting going on already, maybe. Create a component pane. So now we need the component pane, and we need to set the layout, and then we need to add the components to the layout. So we have the, the pane, the J panel, new J panel, and then we have a context. We're going to set that to a border layout, which means it's going to extend from left to right on the border. And we're going to say center. It's going to center, which doesn't really matter because we're expanding the entire border anyway. So it's going to add uh, scrolling text. Scrolling text is up here. Scrolling text was our pane. So the J pane added the because we actually hadn't created the we actually, we hadn't actually created the instance of the J pane yet. What we created was a J scroll pane. And this J scroll pane was the pane that was holding the text area information, which is actually the file, the text that we're creating for the file. So now we're taking and we're creating the actual pane and we're sticking the scroll pane inside of the pane. So we have the content set layout. We're going to set a right board layout. From content, we're going to add the content of the scroll text to the border layout. We're going to center it. So if I said, let's just change this one to oops, left. There we go. Oops. Now let's just center. Let's keep it at centered. Actually, I don't want to mess up the interface. Center plus. Uh, I'm not quite sure why I misspelled that. Uh, I'm not quite sure what happened with that. Uh, create the menu bar. Okay, so here's our menu bar. So are we are we okay with this part right here? In terms of what we're doing, we're creating a pane. We're taking, we're adding the scroll pane inside of the main pane that's going to be part of the outer blanket that we're going to have that's going to hold, be held inside of the frame. And. Uh, we're just setting the layout because we can we can arrange the items we can arrange the components in the pane any way we want the border layout is going to tell us how we're going to want to arrange those items and then we're going to create the menu bar and the menu bars this is what I was going to say is, is actually quite trivial it's actually kind of kind of easy and the menu bars are going to a new menu bar we're going to create a new J menu bar and um, the menu the menu bar that we're going to have is going to have a file menu. So we have to create the file menu. So J menu file menu is equal to new menu bar dot add J menu file. So we have a menu bar, and then we have a menu. <laughs> so for your style, you're going to take this code and put the word style here. You may maybe put it underneath here, maybe in another little section of code if you wanted to add it, because you could take this and you know use it as a base for your application actually. Add the style menu. And then for the style menu, you're going to want to add in some actions. Not going to be these actions. Uh, in fact, you're going to you're going to have to program it a little bit differently. And here in the file menu, we're going to set a mnemonic. You know, remember in the old days when you used to press Control F, Control C, and it used to run the GUI. Well, that's sort of like what this is doing. It takes some underlines. In fact, I didn't notice it though, and I didn't point it out. But in the GUI, you see like you know from file F is supposed to be underlined. On certain platforms, this might work. On certain platforms, you might not see the underlying. This is for people in the old days when people didn't have mice. <laughs> Everybody's got a mouse on their computer now. But in the beginning, some people didn't have a, a mouse. So they were using the keyboard to work the menu. 
That's what this is for. You know, so it's an itemable. If you selected Control F or was it Alternate F or something, I can't remember what it was, it would actually select it instead of the mouse selecting it. Um, file menu add the open action, add the save action. This is a separator line. Add a separator line. This is you know like, uh, that nice beautiful line that shows up, the clear line underneath, and then we have the exit on the bottom. So add the exit action. So for each one of the menu items. We're adding the action so that when the person clicks on open, we have the open action that's going to perform. And save action and exit action. And then we set the window content and the menu. So we set the content panel to content. And we set the set J menu bar to the menu bar. So we're setting, we're putting these pieces together now. We're saying that the menu bar is the menu bar that we're going to have that we're going to put inside. So we're stacking the items up, so to speak. And then we can set the other characteristics of the window, and that might be a set of default close option, close on exit uh, for the J-frame. These are J-frame components that we're setting in here. We're setting the title to my text editor. I'll just put in here another text editor. So you can kind of see. Pack. Interesting concept. You can actually leave it out, and it's okay. What pack does is it pre sets the components. So what we've got is a component inside of a container, inside of a pane, inside of a window, inside of, you know, all these things are all stacked up. Well when you open up the application and you look at it, sometimes it might not actually load all at once. <laughs> you ever seen those graphic programs in the earlier days that like, oh now this appeared, oh now that appeared. And like the program is like loading in a sequence. This preloads it all, gets it ready, so when it's actually physically shown, it's all put together. It's not, you're not going to see any flicker, any weird things. It's all going to be secret. So packing it, packages it all up, makes it presentable, then shows it to the user. It delays the physical showing, the appearance on the screen, until it's all built. Which, why they called it pack? I don't know. should call it like, you know, maybe, you know, pre-pack. Pre-package it. Reset it, pack it up. You can leave it out. The program will work just fine. Except for, you know, in kind of slow computers, the GUI might not look right initially. It might take a few minutes. And actually, I believe it or not, some of them won't allow you to, to do it without a pack, actually. Some of the, like, I think some of the IDEs for, for the Java components will just put that in there automatically anyway. Set location relative to nothing, which means it's going to show up in the middle of the screen. Actually not. I think by default, I think it's supposed to show up in the left, upper left-hand corner of the screen. You know, like, because we have options where we're going to put this window. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if it, don't quote me on it. The default location might actually be in the middle of the screen. But you're not setting the location. If you want it relative to something, you could set it at the top of the screen, the bottom of the screen. So, or on top of another screen. If you think about the concept, this can be done to create a frame that's going to load up while another program is running. Do you really want it behind the current program or something? You know, so if you put it relative to another component, you can make sure the user actually sees it. So. Set visible to true. <laughs> that's an interesting one. I mean, if we set this to false, nothing's going to happen. The screen's out there, but we can't see it. Nothing will be visible. Uh, so we set it to true, it makes it visible. So the bottom part of this code is all the action items. It's, it, it was when we click on all the menu items, these are the things that are going to happen for us automatically. So we have the class open action, so it's going to open up an abstract action. It's, excuse me, it extends abstract action. Because all of the action instances that we're using are abstract classes. So if you don't like abstract classes, you're not going to like this concept. Uh, because we're extending abstract classes by implementing at this point, I mean, it's, it's probably going to be old nature to you. Here's our constructor. Our constructor for this class that we're putting together is a uh, open action, and it's it's a class because it's an object that we're creating. The object is the open action listener object, and when the open action occurs, we're going to essentially do this open command. And open is run from super constructor from this class abstract action. It's going back up through the hierarchy. If you remember super and this and what I went through, it's the same concepts apply towards the extension of classes. We're inheriting, we're not actually implementing an abstract class, we're inheriting 
we're extending abstract action to run open to open up the file chooser which is excuse me the file chooser is already open we're performing the open action <laughs> that is going to invoke the file chooser open Yep, up here on the top. This is where I said, now you're going to go, where? what are these things? Uh, we've created the objects for open action, save action, and exit action. And these action objects are new instances of these exit action. These are all inherited from the action, action listener. Or action, abstract action. Abstract action is the class that we're inheriting from that contains so the base class and the open action correct correct if you go back then look at the reason why I wanted to show you that lecture first if you go back and look at that lecture when I showed you the action listener we have action abstract action and from that on the right hand remember that slide I said well it's all fuzzy you can't read any of that stuff that's on there that is a list of all of the objects that are created or part of you know, the open action, the save action, the list, for, the list, there's, look, for each one of the action, we create our own action object or event object, and we apply the listener for it, and the listener for it's going to be, is it a button click, is it a close activity, is it this activity, is that activity. There's an entire hierarchy of it. Nobody actually memorizes the entire hierarchy. Instead, you kind of pull, what event am I looking for? What option am I looking for? And then you extend act, abstract action which is the abstract concept of an action occurring and you say well here it's going to be open and when we're looking for when we when the action of open action occurs it's signified by open and then we're going to have down here we're going to have save and this is just essentially creating the action object that we can we can look for we can actually um, have an event that's going to occur when this action is performed. And the action is going to be performed on open, which is going to be our menu option to open, or save menu option. So we're putting on the numeric, or we're putting in an integer 0, 1, 2, 3, as a way of keeping track of action number 0, 1, 2, 3. When the action is performed, that is, we go through the menu option and we select open, then we're going to essentially, the action is performed when we've selected open from the menu option. And the action for, uh, that's going to be performed for us is right underneath it. In fact, this is, a, this is inside of, uh, this is associated with the open action that's extending abstract action. We're creating a, oops, here we go. File chooser, show option dialog, this is Java pad, this is what we call the, uh, the class, this. If you remember, um, this is sort of like a file pointer. If you remember, if, if you've ever done any file I.O. in like C or C++, you have like a, what's called a file descriptor, it's an integer value, and the file descriptor, you do that and you open a file, and then the open file is associated with this descriptor, and you read right to the descriptor which is sort of like what this concept is doing um, in a non-C++ way, <laughs> very much of a Java way. It's uh, going to go through and it's going to give you for file f is going to be equal to, and this, consider this more like the file descriptor for f, is going to be equal to file chooser get selected files. This is the automated behavior for the show open dialog. Um, this is going to create from file chooser run the method, because file chooser can have different methods like you know, as an example show open dialog in the slide Oops, get selected file save file and um, these are all the methods that are run on the object of the file chooser the file chooser is going to be right here file chooser is from j file chooser our file chooser component that we created and again this is kind of like why I put it all up here because then you can keep track of what is this object what am I going to use? And then I can universally use the same file chooser and not create many different instances of this. Only use one instance of it, reuse it over and over again. It's just a file chooser object that we created that we decided that we're going to, to use to open and close files and to save files for this application. Um, 
Oops, I went down too far. Or did I? Another editor. Uh, let's see. Here we go. That is this program. That's a way of say, that's a crude way of saying that this program owns it. This this thing I've called here, this program that I'm writing, this class is called JavaPad. So it's JavaPad.this, which is basically saying for this program, open up. Use this for this object here that we've got. Show the open dialog. It replaces the it replaces the the window here. Actually, let me show you real quick what this is doing. Actually, let me make this smaller so I can. I believe I might have to. Uh, I made some changes. Let's see. Hopefully, these changes work. Where's my little screen? It's part of. It's inherited from. It's a sub window of JavaPad. JavaPad would be the main application. This is the file chooser. And so this option that we had here, this is what showed up. Open dot dot dot, save dot dot dot. We set the action to be performed on open dot 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 using the action, uh, abstract action. The abstract action said, look for this open dot dot dot. When you find this thing, do this. So if I go like this, and I try to type inside of JPAD. This has been replaced. This is now part of this. So I can only use this. I can use this if I wanted to. I can click outside of it. But now the focus, I should call it the focus. It's this object is now, the sub object is now being performed. So, and I can probably hear it. It's, it's, it's going to complain. <laughs> I've replaced the, the object activity, object focus, object behavior is now this. And this is this is this is this. <laughs> if I, <laughs> I don't know, I'm not explaining that well. This is that, this is this. But now this is this. So if I go save, I'm gonna have the same thing. I'm not I have to it focuses it it, it the Java pad dot this re, this replaces JavaPad got this in terms of its object um, instantiation. This is still here. It's still visible on the screen, but this is taking its place, which means I can't use this. It's not available to me. All right, let me go back, finish up the example. We're almost done with it, actually. Uh, oops. The rest of the code is actually kind of trivial because it's all the same. So we're going back up here. Now hopefully this makes more sense. <laughs> we're sending super. We're sending it open, saying that from the open, we're we're looking at the abstract action. The abstract action is going to be performed from our action performed. When the event occurs, we capture the event from the action performed, and we have this action performed event that's taking on the event occurred. Well, the, what's the event occurred? Well, it's the open occurred, the open event, open action, open action. Oh, open action. So. Make a new, uh, take the file chooser option and show the open dialog. That open dialog that I showed you is different from the closed save dialog. We're only going to do two of them here. And then uh, this is just going to be what you're going to do in order to, you know, if it's a proved option, which means is the file selectable, it's an actual file and not a directory or something like that. Then take the file and make file, make the file pointer for file f equal to whatever file you selected. And then we're going to open it. And this is what I went over. I believe I went over file I.O. already. Um, the file reader, reader, and reads a new file. And this is all old stuff you've seen before. The text area dot read is going to be the reader. So take one of these, each one of these bytes that you're going to read in, byte by byte, byte, put it in that little text area. So what you're seeing is not actually the file in that text editor. You're seeing the file opened up and then all the contents added to the text editor, text area. And then here, standard I.O. exception, as we saw in the last lecture, to uh, perform an I.O. exception, print out the print out the error message. So now the rest of us is actually kind of easy because we saw the uh, open action. Well, now we got the save action. Lo and behold, save dot dot dot. <laughs> that was put in the menu item. That save save action is doing the same thing. It's extending action. This is where I say, after you write one method, they all look the same. 
you can probably just cut and paste and change the words around and the actual well, this is going to be a little different. Now we're going to do the show save dialog and we're going to replace java.this we're going to have the show save dialog kind of go into the same memory spot so that this we have to click on this thing and then if it's a if it's an approved file name which I don't think anything's not going to be approved unless you call it an exe but I don't think it even checks that far if you put a file name in it sets the flag to approved then uh, get the selected file that you're going to save it as and then we're going to do the opposite file writer uh, write you know create a new instance of the file writer and then in the uh, text er area do a dot write on the writer object so use the text component to write out the essential information back to the file and then do some IO handling essentially so this is a good example actually to reinforce the concepts of the file IO and the file chooser and stuff like that that we've already seen but unfortunately we saw it two weeks ago so <laughs> not quite as fresh as it probably should be here's the easiest part of the exit action <laughs> Look at that exit. <laughs> so it's sending the uh, exit action back up. When it gets it, it's going to do a system.exit, which is going to close down, close down the program. And uh, so if you've been watching this video, you can cut, actually can type it. Type that's the end of the code. Actually, believe it or not, there's no more code underneath there. That's the entire application of that Java Pad program, as we saw it. And uh, so what you're going to do for the assignment is you're going to come back up here. You're gonna. You already got the J menu. Menu by hands create another menu. All right, but you can create instead of a file menu, you can create a J menu here. You take this one, create one for style, and then load up the style right next to the file. Add it right next to it, which is the same process essentially. And then um, add your items. What your items are gonna be? Well, down here is gonna be a little different. In fact, it's gonna be a little easier because you don't actually have to do an action. We well, have to do an abstract action. But you don't have to do uh, you don't have to do a file chooser. You don't have a file I/O with that. It's just change the font on the screen. And where's the font? The font's right up here. <laughs> change the text area to something else. Actually, I didn't even notice it. To, uh, it probably was changed. You can mess around with the border. You can mess around with the title. You can mess around with all of the other components if you wanted to. Um, and I think the other one is to set the background and the foreground color. That's actually not given to you but it's pretty simple. It's actually just run another property on that text editor to set the background color or run one to set the foreground color. So the assignment after I've shown it to you this way is should be fairly easy. Unfortunately you can't learn this by listening to me talk about it or watching it on the screen when you actually type it in yourself and see it run yourself. And I highly encourage you to play around with it. You can add, certainly add more menu items if you want. Have it do different things. And what you get in the end is a notepad. So if you don't have a text editor you like, you can create your own text editor. So, you know, actually, I'm thinking about doing that for, for me, actually, because I wouldn't mind the text. I always have to, like, make things big, especially when I'm showing it to you. I think I might just recompile this and check it. And put a little icon out here and <laughs> basically use that as my text editor now because um, it's not going to support everything. My Well, actually, it does. What does a text editor do? It just allows you to open up a text file. But I wouldn't mind the, the font, you know, showing things like really big, you know, so you can see it. <laughs> set a huge font, set the colors and stuff, you know. People go, what text editor are you using? I'm using Java, Java Pad. <laughs> or my Java class. <laughs> Might be fun, actually, for next time I teach the HTML class. So. Questions, comments, or concerns? Believe it or not, I didn't show you everything there is about uh, Swing. Well, actually, I did, but I didn't show you all the components. So what I left out was all the boring stuff. I could go through every single one of the 200 plus components that exist. And there's a few more components. Because I didn't show you the radio boxes or the check boxes or any other things. But you know what ends up happening? It's all done the same way. Just the same way as that text editor a single component was put on. If you were going to put boxes and stuff, if I were going to if I were going to upgrade this program, I'd make the text editor not go down to the bottom, leave a little room on the bottom, make it not go from 20 to 80, but maybe 20 to, let's say, 40, 15 to 40 MIPS, let's say. And then uh, at the bottom of the screen, I'd put maybe a row of buttons or something. Or maybe I'd put, you know, people like to put the rows of buttons on the top for some reason. Like, 
you know, that little button controls instead of the menu controls, perhaps. And if you're doing that, you're adding a button instead of a menu item, and the buttons are just added on the same way. And then I would probably create a panel up there, put the buttons in that separate panel, and then you're controlling the actions. So you're creating an abstract action for a button click, and then once a button click occurs, you're going to do from an action implementation, you're going to take from the abstract action of the button click, from button, you're going to have an action performed that you're going to write. You see this one says public action performed. This one down here says public action performed. These are subclassed actually by the way. They're nested so you can probably see by all of the closing brackets. Another important thing I forgot to mention was that it knows which one's associated with which object knows which one it belongs to because this is a sub-object of this object. It's actually enclosed inside of this object. So it's not, these are not like separate, separate implementations or separated out. Because one of the problems you'll do is you'll end up with, you know, error messages that come out and say, and the error message is going to tell you that there's a save action or the action performed is not associated with an action or something. Because you, if you nest it correctly, the action listener with the action, all together enclosed in the same scope, which is going to be inside of the same object, then you're going to end up with a working program. If you mess up the nesting, <laughs> it's going to get confused. And then the wrong action is going to be performed, or the same action is going to be performed for all objects or something of that nature. So, so as I scroll through it, you can, uh, you can probably see how it is nested. So, I'm not one for comments, otherwise I go, you know, this is the end of this one. This is the end of this one. This is the end. So I'll just go, here it is. See, it's nested. <laughs> All right, questions, comments, concerns? Nope. All right, next time we're on to another topic. I'm not quite sure what topic, but we're slowly getting done. Okay, see you next time. All assignments are due on the 12th, by the way. Did I tell you that? <laughs>